That's why it's important for you to stay muted so we don't get any background noise. So now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Shelley Langdale, the curator and head of modern prints and drawings at the National Gallery of Art. Shelley has had a long and varied professional career in the art world. Amazing for someone who looks so young. <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely so impressed with all the many things that she has done over the length of her career. And before her tenure in Washington, she's been at the National Gallery now for about a year and a half. She, um, she held curatorial positions at the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard University, the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. <clears throat> Over the years, she has organized a wide range of ex exhibitions from Renaissance drawings to Japanese prints and modern and contemporary works on paper. Shelley has had a long-standing interest in the work of African-American artists. She co-authored the first major publication on the Boston artist, John Wilson, and Rhode Island artist, Joseph Norman, which was accompanied by an exhibition of both artists' work at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston in 1954. 1994, I'm sorry, not 54. <laughs> that would have been quite a feat. No, 94. She was an active member of the African American Art and Artists Working Group at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which focused on developing new strategies for collecting, displaying, and programming work by underrepresented artists at the museum. Currently, Shelley is working on several projects for the National Gallery, including a collaborative installation of works from the collection by Black artists, exploring themes of art and resistance, and this is organized with curators throughout all departments at the National Gallery, and an exhibition of works from the permanent collection exploring the legacy of expressionism from the early 20th century to the present, scheduled for spring 2022. Among her many volunteer prof professional activities, and there are far too many to mention here, I will say that she is the president of the Print Council of America and serves on the board of the Print Center in Philadelphia. Please join me in a warm and virtual welcome to Shelley. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly, for that very generous introduction. And it's my pleasure to be with you all today. Um, we're, you know, I hope that you will be patient with some of the jury rigging and clearing my microphone that I'm going to have to carry around with me and some um, curtain changes here that will happen. Um, intermittently, but I want, I thought it would be fun to meet in the study room today. It's so hard having these um, virtual presentations uh, and not be, being with people and being present, but at least we'll have a sense of scale rather than, than just looking at a PowerPoint. And that was one of the reasons I like to do it this way. Um, but I thought um, when Beverly and, and Nancy asked me to uh, give a presentation for the Washington Print Club, I thought, it might just be fun to share with you some of the things that I've been thinking about recently. Um, I have been coming in one or two days a week, although we're, we're supposed to continue to work remotely as much as possible, but I'm working hard to get to know the collection since I wasn't even here a full year before we shut down. Um, and as Beverly mentioned, um, one of the things that I've um, been working on, and we're not sure exactly when this is going to take place yet, um, is this show about art and resistance and, and looking at works by black artists in the collection. And I've just been sort of surveying the collection generally to see where we have strengths and gaps and um, directions we probably want to move forward with our acquisitions and shows. And, you know, it's interesting when you, you know, have a particular mindset or theme in mind and you're going through the collections and um, objects that you might have been aware of um, that you didn't think about necessarily together start to speak to one another. And so one of the things that um, really caught my attention when I was going through the collection were the two works um, behind me. Um, and I hope you can see them. I will be providing closer up details, um, but they're on the left here is, um, or I guess that's the right of your screen, um, is uh, the, diptych print um, called Condition Report uh, by Glenn Ligon. And I'm sure you recognize the image um, in probably two ways. One, because it 
is a version um, of our famous painting by Glenn Ligon, um, I Am a Man, which was uh, his first uh, painting that actually took a known text and used that, incorporated that into the work. Um, he's now very well known for his use of texts borrowed from uh, history and African-American literature that he uh, uses and manipulates as image in a variety of media to explore issues of representation, gender and um, identity and racial difference. And um, the painting um, is from 1988. And these two, this diptych, which I hope just I'll stand up so you can get a sense of the scale. He very purposely um, did not uh, make them quite the same scale as the painting. And they are, he planned it as a diptych because you'll see, and I'll show you closer up in a PowerPoint in a moment. This is literally a digital print of the painting itself. And this, um, which you can see there's some writing all around it. And some of you, many of my colleagues I know will recognize it as notations by a conservator making notes like scattered digs in upper paint layer, brown smudge, hairline cracks here, all making notes that are from an actual condition report that Glenn made, um, that a conservator made for Glenn's painting when it was being sent off um, on loan. And this diptych, this print diptych was made in the year 2000, so 12 years after Glenn made the painting. I'm sure many of you will also recognize the painting as being a version of the famous sign that was carried in the um, sanitary worker strike um, in the 1960s by the striking workers. And that was the source of inspiration for Glenn's painting. He saw an actual placard from that march um, in Charles Engel's office in the 1980s when he was participating um, in the Whitney um, Independent Program for Artists. Um, so he made the painting when he was quite a young man. He was um, in his late 20s at the time. His purpose, his reason for revisiting um, the painting in 2000 was he was um, interested in thinking about uh, sort of the changes over time in, in the meaning of the image and in the painting itself um, and the resonance that those changes and sort of wear and tear of the painting, the inherent wear and tear, um, what that suggested about the topic of declaring I am a man and having to declare I am a man. One of the reasons that I was thinking about this, um, uh, this diptych paired with this image of Martin Luther King um, by the artist John Wilson, which I'll talk more about in a minute, is because both of these suddenly really resonated with me in new ways uh, after the Black Lives Matter movement really um, came to the forefront this spring. And one of the reasons for that was some of the um, repeated pleas and um, statements from many of the work of the uh, protesters and from some of the families of the victims um, who were murdered, um, unfortunately, in the past year. Things like, you know, they're tired of the fight, the fact that this is a um, representation and, and language taken from a placard from over 60 years ago. Um, the fact that this kind of um, idea of declaring um, equity and even recognition as being a person is still having to be um, argued. Um, and particularly paired with um, John Wilson's very um, sort of unstereotypical view of Martin Luther King. He's not shown here as some kind of superhero. Um, we'll look, I'll show you some close-ups in a moment, but he's, you know, really rendered as, it, it's almost like this is a text for that. I am a man. I am a man like anybody else. I get tired. I um, am, am, you know, strong and I have fortitude, um, but I am a person. I'm not some kind of superhero. Um, and so one of the things um, 
again about Glenn revisiting this in the year 2000 was he started to also think about how that term I am a man had shifted for him in the 12 years since he first um, created the painting, including um, what it means to be a man from a gay man's point of view, how ideas and views about sexuality um, were changing, the whole AIDS crisis of the 1990s um, that the gay community suffered from so greatly and had become intermixed um, with civil rights and expanded civil rights um, across gender as well as race and ethnicity. Um, so it just seemed to have, you know, it's, you know, I think we all look at art objects and sort of the iconic and great work being something that continues to have renewed relevance over time. And this is sort of an interesting example of an artist reflecting on his own work in that, in that way. Um, so the John Wilson, um, one of the things, reasons that I wanted to show it both for, um, in a PowerPoint and um, in person is because I did want to give you, again, a real sense of the scale, because I think one of the things that's so impactful about this very sensitive um, and expressive portrait of King is that he's kind of, you know, in conversation with you. <laughs> he's sort of your scale and you can look deeply into his eyes and see both this incredible kind of thoughtfulness and in, in intellect and pain um, of the burden that he bore in, in his struggle for civil rights. And I love how John, this is a, I should say, this is an etching and dry point um, made at Jim Stroud studio in Massachusetts um, where John lived. And he really makes incredible use of just making strokes right into the plate to get these incredibly thick, um, multi-layered contour lines. And what I feel, one of, one of the reasons I think this is such a quintessentially um, John Wilson um, work is that it really marries uh, two really influential um, parts of his uh, artistic study because he went to the museum school in Boston. He grew up in Roxbury. Um, fell into a boys and girls club where they taught him how to draw and realized that he had this real talent. And after he graduated from the uh, Museum, uh, Museum of Fine Arts Boston um, Art School, he got a scholarship to go to Paris um, in the 40s where he studied with Leger. And he really, um, he worked on murals with Leger, which was very impactful for him, um, but really was taken with this idea of figurative but minimalized and monumental and having a sense of structure and um, spatial presence. And I think you can see that even in these sort of the simple outline of his torso, you still have a sense of it as a physical existing um, form in space. The other um, uh, aspect of his studies that was very impactful for him was when he returned to the States, he married a white woman and um, John himself was African-American and it was very uncomfortable um, at that time to be an um, interracial couple in the United States. And he followed a number of uh, American artists to um, Mexico to study with the Mexican muralists, um, worked at the TGP, and with other artists working down there, made some murals himself and was really taken with the commitment to a public art, um, to you know, community and the idea of making art for the common good um, and reaching out um, in, um, you know, with really um, sensitive uh, images intimate images that were at once, um, uh, you know, sort of invoked a lot of feeling, but at the same time um, were universal in some way. Um, so I'll turn now to, so, cause I know it's kind of hard to really appreciate and see the details of these works. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and hopefully you guys can go to speaker view and get me out of the way. Um, so you can see here, I hope, um, the 
you can see more clearly the little notations that were made by the um, conservator on the um, sort of inherent flaws that happened as the painting has aged 12 years. And I should say too that he, um, Glenn purposely created a lot of texture and um, he did not make this a pristine painting when he made it. Again, to sort of interestingly evoke some of the same idea of the struggle um, and sort of impact of time and, and effort that you see in John's work with these layered lines. Um, and I'll tell you, um, many of you may be familiar with this piece. I know some of my colleagues are, and hopefully some of you may have had the opportunity to see when my colleague Patrick Murphy um, put up um, all of the different impressions of the different states of this plate. Um, I think John took it through 16 or 17 states um, in which he uh, worked the plate again and again between taking impressions. Here, I'm trying to get it to go forward. Come on. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble getting it. There we go. Oh, here you can see better some of the inscriptions um, on the right half of the diptych. And here you can see, I just wanted to show you the I am a man for those of you who aren't familiar with it. This is the um, placard that was used in the sanitation workers strike in 68. And then again, in a poor people's campaign in DC um, the same year. This, uh, the other important um, connection of course is that it was the sanitation workers strike um, where in Tennessee where King was shot on his balcony of his hotel after he had made his speech um, to the sanitation workers to aid them in their uh, fight for better wages. So I was saying, as I was saying, there were the plate for the John Wilson portrait of King went through 17 states. And thanks to my colleague Patrick, he very kindly provided me. Um, with, impression, with images of all of the states. And I thought it would be really helpful for you to get a sense, um, since I can't show this to you in person and you can't quite see all of the wonderful thumbprints and things um, that were registered on the plate um, to really show you how worked up um, this is. But I feel like the, it's one of those interesting um, examples where the sort of process of creating the plate for John served as a, as a metaphor um, for King's work. So I'm going to walk, I'll walk you through it now. Here's just a couple of details where you can really see these wonderful lines um, that articulate his eyes. And you get a sense now, I think, of what I was referring to when I say when you, you know, you're sort of one-on-one -on -one with the print, you can, you really gaze into these eyes that are so soulful um, in a way that's, that's often different from um, the iconic portraits that you see. And again, too, just the gestures of describing his neck there um, have their own sort of sense of expressionist, of expression and passion. So this is what the plate first looked like. And I'm just going to quickly walk you through um, to give you the sense of how John built up the image on the plate and, and erased and then added. And he, he used some aqua tint as well, but you can see he first sort of built it up. He almost ages some too over time, I think. I mean, you have to remember he was only 39 years old um, when he was killed. But here you can see he's burnishing away. He burnishes away. He goes and adds in more aquatint and line, takes some of it away, and he keeps sort of changing the expression and layering the work. You can almost sort of feel, um, you know, the, the sort of ups and downs of, of King's struggle and efforts as you go through. And the boldness of the contours building up over time. So this is the final state, um, which does have also Sheen Collet. He decided to add a Sheen Collet um, tonal background to offset um, the contours a little more. But he, John was um, 
really amazing as a draftsman. When he came back from Mexico, he didn't have um, much luck uh, finding a way to do murals, which is what he really wanted to do. Uh, and so he started to turn, not surprisingly, given the nature of even uh, of, uh, of a work like this, which was done later, this was done in 2002, um, but he, he was sort of a natural um, sculptor as well, because he was so interested in this idea of form and space. Um, here, I'll just show you where he started and where the print ended, which I think is a, a really wonderful comparison. And some of you living in DC, of course, um, may or may not be aware of John Wilson's 1985 bust of Martin Luther King. It was one of his um, proudest commissions um, that uh, he created sitting in the rotunda in, um, uh, in the Capitol building. Um, and he did a number, he did several portraits of King over time and uh, two major sculptures, this being one of them. And you can see here how it clearly um, is reminiscent of that, um, but he's even more, I think, um, uh, haggard <laughs> in, uh, in the printed version. Um, he's a little more stoic um, in, and, and refined and sort of um, polished, um, partially because of the nature of the medium in the Capitol building sculpture. Uh, and this is just a great picture of um, Obama um, walking through the rotunda on Martin Luther King Day um, in 1913 and standing in front of the sculpture to pay his respects, which I just thought was really lovely, um, particularly compared um, with this image of John Wilson himself um, oop, looking up at a model um, for another Martin Luther King sculpture that he created for a public park in Buffalo. And the reason I'm bringing this up um, is partially because one of my favorite drawings that I left behind in Philadelphia is this marvelous drawing of Martin Luther King um, that was a study um, for this Buffalo sculpture, which I'm showing you on the right in its final form, um, executed in bronze, eight feet tall, and was the subject of a lot of controversy, um, which he eliminated in the Capitol building version by, by at least having a torso. Um, there was a lot of controversy about this head that rose directly from the ground um, instead of the sort of usual standing figure, which of course is the subject of a lot of discussions right now as we review monuments and, and how they're being made. And this is where I feel John was so prescient in the way he um, chose to do uh, this sculpture of uh, Martin Luther King in Buffalo. And it relates to our print and to a uh, idea of John's that sort of ran throughout his work. Um, and one sort of version of it, another version of it aside from the King sculpture was this sculpture, Eternal Presence from 1987. Um, which is installed on the grounds of the National Center for Afro-American Afro Artists in Roxbury, um, where he was born and grew up. And this is modeled on King, on all kinds of portraits that he did over the years. And his concept was, and, then, and the reason it's named Eternal Presence, was that he was always seeking, and I think this, this is where the, his experience in Me Mexico had such a profound effect on him, for the idea of the underlying humanity of all people. And so the idea of this eternal presence was that this head sort of represented humanity and that it would have um, a resonance with people of all colors, but including um, people black um, of, uh, from the African diaspora or from Africa, that there was, that that was central to um, his concept of a universal humanity and that it rises out of the ground, you know, as an integral part of the natural world. And this of course uh, was based on uh, the Olmec head and the Easter Island heads or the Moai monoliths as they're known. Um, from, you know, that date from all different periods over the course of human history and really, um, you know, was a 
for him a way of sort of, you know, getting past um, racial difference and, uh, and was an, an important part of the civil rights movement um, that he represented um, throughout his work. And I should add that the, um, one of the seeds for this idea also came from his time studying with Leger in Paris, where he spent a lot of time at the Musée Quai Branly, where they have um, all kinds of ancient art from different parts of the world. And that had a, a profound effect on him as well. Now, next, um, I'm gonna let you look at this for a minute and talk to you, but you are going to have to bear with me because I am going to do a switch behind me, a curtain change, if you will, um, to put up the actual objects. Um, but I wanted to share with you uh, two of our recent acquisitions. One of the first acquisitions I was able to sneak in last year before we closed down um, is our five works by Emma Amos, who I think may be familiar to many of you. She was recently featured in um, Soul of a Nation, um, as well as um, some other major exhibitions and will be featured herself finally, in a retrospective that is being organized by my colleague, um, Shania Harris, at the Georgia Museum of Art in Athens, Georgia, um, in the spring, we hope. Um, it will still happen then, and then it will be traveling to Philadelphia, and then I think Munson Proctor Institute. Um, and Emma uh, was born in Atlanta, and she studied at Antioch College in Ohio, Coincidentally, um, I still haven't had a chance to talk to Catherine Brown about this, but apparently they were roommates, Catherine Brown who founded Crown Point Press, or at least they lived in the same dorm. I'm still trying to track down that information, which is an interesting um, coincidence for us um, since we have uh, Catherine Brown's okay to print collection here at the gallery. Um, but as far as I know, Emma never worked with her. So maybe they didn't get along, I don't know but it's, it's still an interesting um, serendipitous fact. Um, and Emma um, is really super interesting young artist. Um, well, she was when she was young. She, not only did she study art history and printmaking in Antioch College, but she actually took a year abroad um, at the Central School of London where she studied etching and then came back to campus, graduated and went back to London to study printmaking. Um, and then she ended up um, in New York City where she printed some with Robert Blackburn and Latario um, Calipai. Uh, but being a black woman in the 60s, you didn't have a whole lot of options um, for an art career. She's probably best known if she's known to people for being the only female um, member of the famous short-lived but influential artist collective Spiral, um, which was spawned in 1963, just before, but in response to the March on Washington, um, as a space where uh, African-American artists could sort of contemplate and discuss what is what should the role be um, for African artists in this crucial moment of civil rights. Um, what was their responsibility in helping to advance the cause? And that led to a lot of discussion about figural work versus abstraction and could abstraction be political and all kinds of things that continue to um, be discussed today. Um, and um, her theory was since she was in her early twenties that she was just um, brought into that group with Norman Lewis and Hale Woodruff and others because she was young and wouldn't be as vocal or opinionated as Camille Billups or Faith Ringgold or some of the other of her older women colleagues. Um, but nonetheless, it was a very important experience for her. And um, she, the, she participated in the only uh, Spiral exhibition in 1965 and then Spiral sort of dissipated um, over the next few years and she worked as a textile designer and taught at various schools. She even ran a short-lived um, uh, uh, craft program on PBS um, to make a living and while she was raising her two young kids. And then she finally got a um, 
position at Rutgers. She got a professorship um, with, that was a 10 year track position in 1980, the year that this print was made. And so bear with me a second while I go get that print. Okay, see, normally I would have like given you time to come up and look closely at things, but um, we can't do that in the virtual world. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to, I wanted to bring out these two prints. Um, as I said, we collected uh, five works um, by Emma last January, and I wanted to pick a range of works from throughout her career so we could sort of have a really nice representation um, of her work as an artist and since printmaking was so integral to her work um, as painting and in, in designing fabrics as well, um, I wanted to be sure I covered all that territory. So the, this work that um, I first mentioned is called Cool Lady from 1980 and I'm comparing it with a 1966 uh, self-portrait called Bold Face Type. And, you know, one of the... Um, Shelly, we, we need you in the microphone. ...really nicely um, showed the <clears throat> building confidence of the artist. Shelly, we really can't hear you. Shelly, we can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to pick up my mic. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, starting over. Um, so I thought it was interesting to compare sort of, and somebody, yeah, sorry. The other thing that happens, just so you guys know, anytime someone unmutes is when I'll disappear from your big screen um, because it'll just go to wherever there's noise. Okay, sorry for the minor interruption. Um, so I thought it was really interesting to look at this early screen print where she's sort of lower down in the screen. She sort of has this, um, you know, abstracted background. And any of you who's um, particularly probably mostly for women, you this will look very familiar to you, you know, from a shampoo ad or any of the other 60s ads um, in which women are uh, portrayed this kind of coy looking back over your shoulder kind of view. So she's lifted it actually, and I'll show you in a moment from um, Ebony Magazine. Whereas this, I love, what I loved about Pool Lady, there are several things I love about this print. One is that it is a tour de force of aquatint um, and etching. The second thing is that I love that it's kind of the classic, on the one hand, uh, she's drawing on the very classic uh, art historical subject of the bather, um, except she's wearing a bathing suit and most uh, bather subjects, as we know, are really an excuse to show a naked lady. Um, and, I, and she's showing, um, she's not over accentuating um, the voluptuousness of her figure. She's certainly very attractive, but um, uh, how can I put this delicately? She's not overly endowed, <laughs> like um, someone might make her if, it was, if that was the point um, of the subject. So she's sort of taken ownership of this subject. She's got her hand on her fist and she's looking out at you um, as much as you are looking at her. She has a very forceful and confident gaze, which I think is really um, significant, particularly made in the year 1980, sort of when she's finally sort of cracked the profession um, and has an established uh, professorship in an important art institution um, at Douglas College. So I want, and the other, um, aspect of this print that is so terrific, um, come on, share, 
uh, from in terms of representing her career is these wonderful, incredible patterns um, that she's used. And I love that she's used a tan paper on which to print um, and how she's uh, used stencil to create this white towel on her head. So it's, and the range of brown inks that she used, it's almost a study in black and brown and color, um, you know, within a mono monochrome palette. But her, her love of weaving and patterns is, is you know, totally um, celebrated here. And as is her sort of uh, continual fascination with sort of testing and pushing um, issues of uh, race and gender in her work, it's, it's almost an embodiment of some of the, um, you know, political phrases and mottos of the 60s and 70s, you know, such as black is beautiful or um, the personal is political. And for those reasons, I particularly thought um, it was a great print in addition to, it's just, I hope you can see it someday because the aquatint is fantastic. And um, if my colleague, Rena Hoisington's aquatint show went later, I know she would include this. It goes forward when I don't want it to, and then it doesn't, come on, there we go. So this is what I was telling you, I just wanted to show you this comparison. And again, this very provocative title um, that she often uses, um, gold face type. Um, the whole issue of the different range of colors of people of color. Um, and some of the prejudice even within um, the black population of lighter skinned versus darker skinned peoples. Um, and one of the reasons that, I mean, I know for a fact just from studying her that she would like Lorna Simpson and others was very much inspired by imagery in Ebony Magazine um, and other black magazines of the day. I just thought the fact that this February 1966 cover just resonated so beautifully, I thought with her um, self-portrait, our Negro girls getting prettier um, and the whole idea of black is beautiful and, and so forth. But you can see the kind of, you know, um, angle and, and uh, composition that I was talking about. I just wanted to show them both together again. And then just quickly, because um, I want to get to um, uh, Alma Thomas, uh, two other works that I acquired are this wonderful piece that I really am dying to show you guys in person because um, it looks first like a collage, um, but it's actually not. Um, what she did was she took this fabulous print, American Girl, 1974, which fortunately we have two impressions of in town, one at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and one at the Library of Congress. Um, and she cut it up. I hope it was a proof that she cut up or a, or a badly printed um, impression rather than one of the ones from the edition, but we don't know. But this is very indicative of, of the way Emma would often incorporate parts of her old work, whether it was scraps of, of uh, textiles that she designed, or in fact, prints or drawings that she used that she would tear up or use as stencils. And what she did here was she tore up the print and then she used it to create, this is actually paper pulp, this gray and this red that's outlining these um, reclining female figures. And it's just a piece of paper that she made with the scraps that she tore up and with liquid paper pulp um, to create this red line drawing from 1981. And the original print was made in 1974. And then the other two prints um, that I acquired uh, going further into her career were Target 1992. Again, I, I mentioned that uh, she had a degree in art history and was very interested in sort of um, revisiting particularly uh, prominent white male subject matter like Jasper John's Target and um, you know, revisiting it in a critical way. So here she's included um, some old pictures that she inherited um, from a family member 
it's one of her uh, relatives. I don't can't remember. It's like a great uncle um, who's now here become the victim of the target. Uh, a comment on the victimization of young black men. Um, and here, this stenciled figure here um, calls to my mind both, you know, Boyce and Borofsky and a bunch of other people. Um, the crown um, is a fantastic carborundum print, incredible luscious texture. Uh, and it, you know, again, a very sort of provocative title. Um, this could be seen as a, the plates on a, a braids on a woman's head, and this could be hair. Um, it could be a ball of yarn of some kind. It also references African headdress. Um, so I, all of Emma's work is very um, rich and provocative. And I thought this range of work would allow us to address um, the many issues that she covers in her work. She was also a guerrilla girl and very involved with Lucy Lepard in the Heresies feminist um, journal in the 70s. And then lastly, because I know um, we're, we're running out of time, um, I wanted to share with you, and I don't know if, if Bob and Tom made it into the audience or not, but hopefully they can watch this later. Um, uh, Bob, Stan, and Tom Judy surprised us um, last year with an Alma Thomas uh, drawing that I'll show you in a minute um, that they came across in their travels, as many of you know, they often travel across the country to visit their family and stop at little antique stores and things along the way. Um, and they made a discovery of a drawing that was very different from what we had. So I just wanted to quickly show you um, the works on paper that we have in the collection from 1971, this wonderful, um, very um, uh, simplified and sort of minimal um, Alma Thomas from 1971, which we uh, were given by Ruth Cole Kanan, of course, um, uh, um, Jacob Kanan was such a, a big fan of Alma Thomas's and they were very close. Um, he very much encouraged her work in um, abstraction when she started to go in that direction um, in the late 60s, early 70s. We were fortunate to get this wonderful early watercolor from 1960 when she really sort of started to focus on her career as an artist um, from the Corcoran collection, as well as this uh, wonderful um, uh, uh, spring fantasy. Actually, I'm sorry, I have these reversed. This is spring fantasy from 1963. Um, and this is the winter shadows from 1960. And then we didn't have anything, although we have painted examples of her wonderful um, sort of mosaic-like abstractions um, that have often been discussed in terms of sort of a, a pointillist or mosaic approach. And Bob and Tom were out on one of their hunts um, in, in an antique store, and I, I actually forget which state they were in, but it was someplace that they had visited regularly on their trips to the Midwest, and they, um, the owner said, you know, you guys are from Washington. I have these two drawings. I think they're Alma Thomas, but I'm not sure. And I don't really know who to go to. You, there must be somebody in Washington that you could take these to and get them um, verified for me, authenticated. And if you can do that, you can keep one of them um, and sell the other. And so this was, they talked about it and he couldn't, the, the antiques dealer couldn't put his hands on them right at that moment. And so he ended up sending them, there was a lot of back and forth and like, I don't know, like a year later, he sent Bob and Tom this drawing um, as well as one that was, um, had a red palette, but very similar and fascinatingly signed um, and dated. She must have, um, given it to somebody because you'll notice on the right, there are these stitch marks, which suggests that it must have been in some kind of sketchbook. It's about, um, yeah, it's 12 by 16 or so, which is, you know, a, a standard size sketchbook. And so I thought this was really interesting. Um, I don't think Tom, I don't know, I can't remember if, if the uh, 
I don't think the antique dealer quite realized that they were probably from a larger sketchbook. And just so happened, we got these last fall and then Jonathan Waltz and Seth Thiemann who are working on, as some of you may know, a major retrospective of Alma Thomas um, for the Columbus Museum in Georgia um, where Alma Thomas was born. And Seth is from the Chrysler Museum where the show will open. Um, and I mentioned to Jonathan that we had gotten to Jonathan Waltz that we had gotten this drawing and it was really interesting. And I was trying to see if I could find more pages from the sketchbook because they must be out there and they have a lot of drawings um, in the Columbus Museum. And he's like, oh my gosh, you know, I had, he had like, read about something that there was, that she had had some of these sketchbooks, but they hadn't really found anything. And he said, it's really unusual that she signed it and dated it because she didn't usually sign and date her drawings. Um, and so this is the beginning of the story. I don't have the end of the story yet, but they did sell the other one, which now I have to track down the owners for. Um, and we're intrigued to see um, if we can find out uh, and possibly reassemble at least part of this notebook. So not only did it uh, expand our representation of the different styles in which uh, Alma Thomas worked, uh, but it also has led to this whole new um, sort of discovery that we're looking forward to finding more about. So I think I need to leave time for questions, um, but I thought this would give you a little bit of a range of some of the paths I've been going down lately. And I am super happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Okay. Thank you so much. This was fabulous, needless to say. <laughs> so I would you guys like- guys have any questions? One question I have uh, from Beth Sanders. She says, was Elizabeth okay. Catlett in Mexico at the same time as Wilson? They did overlap a little bit, yes. Um, he was there in 19, she, he was there in 50 to around 55. He came, he came and left in the middle of that and she was there in the early 50s as well. Okay, interesting. Actually, that's a show that I wanna do, that I really wanna do someday because I don't, the show at the Whitney right now on Vita America and the Mexican influence on American art is really great, but I still wanna do a show about all the black artists that were in Mexico and, and, and figure that exactly out. Who yeah. crossed over, who was all there at the same time and how did they, you know, how did they um, interact with one another? Well, this isn't really a question so much as perhaps a comment. <laughs> Are black females getting prettier because they look more like white females? I don't know. I don't see that, <laughs> but I don't know. I, yeah, no, I, I think that, that part of what I think um, Emma was exploring and explores, if you look at other works by her and was trying to fight against actually was um, sort of the uh, conformity I think that's what the crown is about. The crown is the crown as opposed to the sort of coy 1966 representation of her self portrait is sort of the opposite end of the scale from the crown which celebrates natural black hair. Okay. Then um, could you do <clears throat> you could do a whole exhibit about the evolution of black female hair in Emma's work. She also seems to allude to Alex Katz and add his white hair. True? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, um, I hadn't thought about so much about the Alex Katz thing. And I'm not, I don't, I honestly, that's, that's not an artist I know. I don't know if she was aware of him or not. Very well could be. Very well could be. Also, someone says, absolutely love Emma Amos's work. I looked up her works on the NGA website and noticed a series of prints from 2004 using a method termed color silk aquatint. Could you say a bit about this technique? Okay, yeah, this is, so one of the studios that Emma worked most closely with because was Kathy Caraccio, who has a um, very small, 
um, space in New York City, but she often worked with artists who just would come and needed, you know, who were pretty well developed in their own printmaking skills, but just wanted to come and needed a press and needed access to things. And they worked really closely in experimental ways, oftentimes for reasons of money. Um, it is really hard to abstractly explain color silk aquatint without pictures or objects. <laughs> um, and I don't know if, um, I know Soledad has been working on all kinds of um, techniques involving fabric and things like that too. But I mean, suffice it to say, believe it or not, it may not seem possible, but you can um, treat silk in such a way that it can act as a plate. Um, and you can um, do things to it chemically so that it will function like an aquatint. And in fact, it will give you some of the texture of the silk in the process. So I'm not explaining it probably very well, but that would be a sidebar um, or another um, entire presentation with better pictures and equipment. <laughs> well, I <clears throat> another question I had is, um, I've heard this so many times and I should know, but Shen Kole, what exactly is Shen Kole? Oh, Shen Kole. Okay, so Shen Kole, that's a little easier to explain. Yeah. So if you have your um, plate, your etching plate, um, or engraving plate, but a metal plate, and you have inked the plate, so you have the ink in all of the lines. What you do is you lay down a sheet of um, paper, very thin often. It's called sheen collet because it was often, um, the sheen refers to China paper or like a thin Asian paper. So it's very, very thin. And you lay that face down on the plate, which is inked. It has glue on the back of it often. And then when you put it down on the paper and run it through the press, the sheer between the glue and the sheer pressure of the printing process, it adheres within the plate mark. So it provides like a tonal background that would be different from the paper that you're printing on. Does that make sense? Yes, complicated though to me. <laughs> it's complicated, it's complicated again. But basically you have yeah. the plate, you're putting another piece of paper on top, but it's exactly the size of the image. I see. So when you run it through the press, it just gets printed onto the paper with the, with the printed image. So oh, Chris has a question. I'm gonna let him speak himself. <laughs> yes. yeah, Shelly, what your comments have brought up and what I've heard other in other places are one, that with, as you were just talking about, with the, the silk and the chin collé, the, the whole idea of how to make prints is becoming so expanded and so large and so unique. I'm wondering on the one hand, what does that do in terms of preserving and storing these pieces? And also, does it mean that prints can now only be made in the print studio where you have expert printmakers printing it for you and you can't just go into your own studio and run it off the press? Um, well, that's presuming, first of all, that you have a press in your studio, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> which, which not everybody does. But, um, and no, I, I mean, I think, you know, the, I think Printmakers by nature seem to have always be testing new ways of doing things. Um, but if anything, I think we're kind of going in the opposite direction because I don't know if you've heard about um, the Kansas State University has this incredible project going on where they're actually, they figured out how to um, basically etch plates without acid, but using electro typing and, it is literally their goal is to make it possible so that it's not toxic um, or less toxic and you can do it in your kitchen. So it makes it much more accessible to a wide range of artists who want to make prints. So I think, you know, there's, there's always going to be, you know, the full range of artists who are going to come up with ingenious ways to do things in their kitchen and then um, you know, fortunately, we have wonderful printmaking shops all over the country 
um, that continue to push boundaries like Two Palms Press and Gemini and others. Um, so you'll have, you know, and I think it was really, you know, the the ULAE and Tamarind and, and those places that expanded printmaking to artists who didn't think of themselves as printmakers, which is I think how we got to where we are now. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's been my experience that there are a lot of artists that don't necessarily can, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't introduce themselves as printmakers, but making prints is an integral part of their work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if that answered your question. Well, it does. The only other part was what about how do you preserve and keep them oh. with all their new techniques and everything? Yeah, well, um, there are some challenges with some of that for sure. One of my big pet peeves, and I know there are some artists um, hopefully still still with us here. One of my big pet peeves, and this is, a, this is really important to knowing how to take care of things well, is it drives me crazy when artists use the term mixed media yeah. <laughs> as a single definition of what their medium is because um, sometimes we can tell and conservators and, and curators can look closely and figure it out but sometimes we can't and if we want to take the best care of things the more we know the better off we are um, but yeah I mean we have to think you know ironically though Chris you know I would have to say I think and hope, I think most of my colleagues would agree with me, one of the most sensitive surfaces in all of printmaking is screen print. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's been around a long time. <laughs> um, and it's still probably the most vulnerable surface, uh, especially if you're dealing with, you know, um, Ellsworth Kelly or Lichtenstein, where you have large, broad areas of solid, opaque color, because the tiniest scratch is going to ruin the effect. Yeah. Right. So there's always challenges. I mean, you know, you have to you have to think about the depth of the window mat that you're putting on. Um, you know, some things have to stay frame. It, you just have to to but. Like I said, the more informed you are about the materials involved, the better we can take care of things. And I think one last question from Soledad. Um, she's experimenting with silk to treat it as Japanese paper. And she would love to know more if you have an idea how to go about it. <laughs> okay. Might be a longer conversation, but. That's a longer conversation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but you know, yeah. So maybe not so easy to answer in a sentence or two. <laughs> so. I, I think I know some printmakers that would probably answer that better than I. Some of them might even be on this call. <laughs> okay. okay. But well, well, I'm happy to talk to her. Okay. Thanks. So I, th it, I think that mm -hmm. kind of wraps it up. And I want to thank you once again for a lovely presentation. You have nothing but alkalides from the... Uh zoom chat everybody yeah. particularly interested in emma and most because most of us don't know who she never heard of her i didn't hear of her until you mentioned it at an event for, at the national gallery i'd never heard of her and now i see her everywhere <laughs> so my question is to you did you know her did you ever meet her did you um i well Sadly, um, and Emma, I should say, Emma just passed away sadly in May. So I was, I was actually super happy that we made this acquisition before she passed away. Um, but she had been suffering, unfortunately, from Alzheimer's um, for almost 10 years. And I included her in a show in 2012 at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which is when I got to know her. And she was already having some struggles then. So sadly, I did not meet her in time, but I did have um, the fortune to get to talk to her some. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, you know, she's a classic case of the recognition coming a little bit too late, unfortunately, yeah. um, for her to fully appreciate it. But I'm excited that there's a retrospective. And, um, you know, I think, uh, that's one of the reasons I acquired such a range of her work because I wanted to have opportunities to show it in different contexts. Um, and I, you know, I, I do think that she is one of the um, artists that has been left out of the story. Um, and I think, you know, I look at her, particularly if you go on and see some of her other works where, and there's a fabulous work up at the Phillips right now. 
Yes, right. we saw that. Um, and that incorporates some of her weaving and as well as painting. And, you know, you can't help but think of McLean Thomas and some of these younger artists that have gotten so much attention. And I know that they were aware of Emma's work. And, and so she has an incredible legacy too and needs to be put back into the story. Yeah. And it is being done. <laughs> so yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks to everybody for coming out today. Yes. Um, I wish we could see you um, in person and maybe we will in the next time we will. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.